Hello, welcome to Modules, Sketches and Everything in Between. Introductions. I'm Simon Brown and I live in Jersey and Channel Islands. Most of my career has been spent in London, uh, working for consulting companies, mostly building with Java systems. Uh, moved back to Jersey a number of years ago, did some .NET stuff. And the thing I do at the moment a lot is basically jetting around Europe, uh, helping teams understand what software architecture is all about. And a big part of that is actually teaching them to draw pictures. Uh, and all will become clear later on. It sounded like a good idea at the time, but now I sit here, I'm not so sure. Our, our plan for this, this session is I'm going to do a short pitch on my thoughts. I'm just going to do the same. Uh, some of that will agree, some won't. Uh, and then we've got a bunch of questions which we're going to answer in turn. If you guys have questions as well, feel free to ask us at any time, you know, make this as interactive as you want to. If you want to disagree, agree with us, that's absolutely fine too. Uh, and then we'll try to do a wrap up, like a summary. One. Okay, great. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I'll stop shit. Yeah. And the other thing about the questions, just very quickly, is there are suggestions for our interesting questions. If you disagree with us, tell us and we'll answer different questions, which of course will be much more interesting for you because we want to know the answers and <laughs> ask us the question. Right. So I, I guess the, the summary of this is, is we both think that modeling is a good idea. Right, we should model our software systems to some degree, and, and this is the whole in moderation point. I'm a, I'm a fan of boxes and lines notations. Owen, less so. Less so. Less so. We'll, uh, we'll explore that as we go along. Uh, I have a, a book which is called Software Architecture for Developers, uh, available on LeanPub. In the book, I, I talk about my C4 model, which I'll explain later, and it's a simple way to break down a software system. Uh, I'm also co-author of the book, uh, the co-author of Sitting in the Audience, it's Nick Rosensky. Um, and we also talk a lot about modeling and representing software systems, and Nick, in fact, was a great fan of boxes and lines, uh, which was an interesting dynamic as we wrote the book. <laughs> but uh, the, um, as you'll see later, the approach is actually very similar to C4 in some ways, but it's also quite different to C4 in some ways. That hopefully will be interesting. Hopefully. So what we'd like to do is try to bring these ideas together and see where we get to. Uh, and this is where we like Europe as well. So I guess we should start off with talking about, you know, what's the point of modeling? So from my perspective, it's really about understanding what you're going to be building. So, you know, we take this blank sheet of paper, we take some requirements and some goals, and we need to come up with a strategy, a plan, a vision, so we can build something. And this vision is really how we explain our system, our design, our architecture to the rest of the team. And for me, that's really the essence of why we do modeling. It's to do some upfront thinking. But of course, the whole agile thing, being lightweight, the trick is to not get stuck in 
the detail and not get stuck in analysis paralysis. So that's really where I'm coming at this from. And we agree on more about this than we disagree. Um, definitely modeling for that understanding focuses on the essentials. The big problem if you don't model is have you got intellectual control over the of your system? Do you understand how the whole thing works? Because I observe many software teams who've got lots and lots of code, understand lots of bits and how they work, but not how the whole thing works. The problem is where if you move into the more academic world, and I kind of cross over a bit into research, you get a lot of academics who believe the model is actually the source of the truth. And that's clearly nonsense because the model doesn't run in production. The code runs in production. So that's the problem of modeling, is spending all your time on the model, forgetting that actually it's the code that is actually going to make a difference to the uh, to the business. But of course the model could run in production, and we'll talk about that later, I guess. Right, so some opinions, uh, and I'm going to start this. And the way I, I like to think about architecture, and really one of my key interests in software architecture is how we communicate software design, software systems to the rest of the team. Why so? We're all building the same thing, we're all going in the same direction, and we're, we're trying to avoid chaos, basically. How many people here use UML on a regular basis? It's like one, two, three, four, it's like... Good God, we've got the entire level of UML in one room. Yeah, all four of them. <laughs> So it's a very, very small percentage. I've been to a bunch of conferences in the US. I've traveled to half the countries in Europe. Uh, I've been to the Middle East, China. I'm going to Australia later in the end. I've asked this question pretty much everywhere I've been. And it's normally this kind of ratio. So only about 10% of people generally tend to use UML, in my audiences anyway. So there's also some bias there. Actually, the only time this was untrue was, a, was an architecture conference in London where 50% of the people raised their hands. They were all lying. <laughs> they, didn't use UML. they were all enterprise architects. So, one of the things I, I, I do with teams is, I, is I, I teach them how to draw pictures. And really, I give them some requirements and say, go design a solution, draw some pictures. And lots of people try to put all of their information on a single picture. And we know that this is really, really hard to do. So this is when you read all these architecture books, like Owens, for example, you know, the, the classic Clemens and Bass book. They all talk about views, right? So what we do is we, we kind of chop up our view of the world and we see certain elements at once. Uh, this is Philip Christensen's 4 plus 1 model. So you have a logical view, a development view, a process view, and a physical view, kind of all tied together with these cases on top. Over the years, so the original paper that defined this was very, very specific about what the views meant, but over the years, the, years, the names have changed. In fact, I was reading your book on the flight over from Oslo last night, and, and, and you've renamed some of these things to make them clearer. Yeah, but I think other people have also renamed them to make them clearer as well, so it's kind of confusing. And this is where I struggle. I, I struggle because some of the names of these things don't really make much sense. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I once spent a long time in a meeting arguing <coughs> that there is no difference between a conceptual and a logical view of an architecture. I know people talk about logical and conceptual data models, but from a, an architecture point of view, I don't really understand the difference. Maybe I'm just too stupid. Um, development view. Development view is normally some view of the codes, the classes, the design patterns, how we lay out files and disks or modules or things like this. Some people call that the implementation view. Some people call it the design view. And what's this whole physical thing about? Right? The physical thing is normally about infrastructure. But who uses physical infrastructure anymore? Right? None of us. We're all using virtual. So do we have like a virtual physical view or a physical virtual view? I get my Oculus Rift out, my VR set, and I, I look around my, my infrastructure. Uh, it's just nuts. So it's confusing. And if you look at some of these different ways of modeling systems, you often find that the logical view of the world, and by logical, well, I think we mean functionality, how we're decomposing our system into chunks, is often separated from the development side of things. So you've got this kind of functional modular component view here, and then code, and then they're kind of kept separately. Oh boy, this is complicated. All I want to do is draw some pictures to describe my system. I'm going to forget all this, I'm going to cheat. Right? If, if somebody asks me to go and draw a picture of a software system, I can just go to Google and ask Google's advice. 
And if you go to Google and ask its advice about software architecture diagrams, you get this. This does not help either. It's just page after page after page of colorful block diagram. Do you see these sorts of diagrams in, your, in the organizations that you work for? Do they make sense? Often not. You know, look at these diagrams here. Especially this one in the middle, right? So in architecture, we talk about layering as being a good thing, good thing. So we have a diagram with horizontal layers, but some stuff doesn't quite fit horizontally, so we have these vertical ones that stop the diagram wobbling. <laughs> Why are the layers different heights? Is that important? Well, it probably is. Or maybe the people drawing the picture didn't realize in video you can do make them all the same size. <laughs> same with the width of the boxes. Although maybe width is important, maybe this workflow thing here talks to that service agent's thing. So maybe we're having to imply relationships based on spatial <coughs> layout. We've got color coding I don't understand, we've got acronyms I don't understand, but we do have gradient shading. <laughs> so I can present this on a PowerPoint and it looks beautiful. Over the past you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years, I've been kind of jetting around running training courses, giving people requirements and asking them to draw pictures. And people can't do it. Right? Most people cannot draw a decent, simple architecture diagram to describe a design. Pretty much unanimously, I've never seen a nice picture first time around. So again, this is all adding to the confusion here. Now, of course, what are we trying to show in these pictures? Well, let's imagine that you inherit a system with a million lines of code. Are you going to draw a picture with a million things on? No, that's ridiculous. Right, so let's say it's an object-oriented system and there are 200,000 classes. Are we going to draw 200,000 boxes on this piece of paper? No, that's equally ridiculous. So we're drawing abstractions. Right, we're, we're chunking stuff together. Uh, components, modules, subsystems, layers, these sorts of things. An abstraction is a way to, for us to simplify our view of the world. And really abstractions let us uh, reason about big or complex systems. Right? So we can hold a smaller number of big chunks in our head and use that as a way to navigate down to the detail we need to. And this is where we get to start to talk about UML. Right? Because UML has abstractions. If you look at the Unified Modeling Language, it has components and classes and deployment nodes and use cases and states and all sorts of stuff, right? It's got abstractions, just not useful ones. Yeah, and abstractions on abstractions, of abstractions. And it also has a, a common set of boxes and lines notations to represent these things. Uh, sometimes if you look at components in UML, you've got two different notations you can use. You've got the box with the two things sticking out on one side, and you've got the cup and ball notation. I'm probably wrong, you can correct me later. <laughs> But the notation is confusing, and when I see people using UML, they normally abuse the abstractions or the notation. I'll give you an example. I often see UML class diagrams describing a framework or something, and one of the classes, if you look carefully, will represent an entire software system. I'm like, what? That's not a class. That's, that's something else. So we kind of abuse the abstractions a bit. I also see people in large organizations who have to use, they're forced to use a UML tool, but then their boss asks them to draw like a, a boxes and lines diagram. So what do they do? Well, the class diagram is boxes and lines, so they take all the information out and just use it as boxes with lines. It's just, again, this is adding to the complexity of our lives. So my thing here is let's forget the standard boxes and lines notations. Right? For me, it's the abstractions that I really, really care about. I'm much more interested in creating a ubiquitous language with which we can describe and discuss architecture and have the notation evolve separately. Now, this sounds foolish, right? but let's go get two maps of London. The two maps of London will show the various regions and districts and areas and the River Thames and the tube lines and the schools and the churches, blah, blah, blah. Right? But they might use different notations. They're showing the same things, but they might show them in a different way. They're using different notations. How do we make sense of this? 
well, there's a key in the bottom corner. It's a self-describing notation. So that's really what I like to do. And I like to think of my sketches as maps. So if you go to, uh, if you go to Google Maps on your smartphone and you look up Jersey, you get this view. It's great if you want to know what's inside Jersey, but it's useless if you don't know where Jersey is. So you have to do the pinch zoom out thing and eventually get to this view at the top. I want my diagrams to be the same. I want to be able to zoom into the low level information and zoom out to see the bigger picture. So what I'm really trying to do here is I want to model the static view of the world. Right, modeling the static view of the world is the primary thing I want to do here. And that's essentially code all the way up to the big picture. And then once I understand the static view of the world, I can then throw in the other stuff around it. So you know, deployment, so the infrastructure, and runtime and collaboration behavioral diagrams based upon my static model. Sounds easy, right? The catch is, of course, is that when we're drawing these pictures, the boxes we draw, the abstractions we use, often don't map into the code. Because when we're talking about architecture, we're talking about components and layers and subsystems and services. Show of hands, who's a Java developer or a .NET developer? Is that a good chunk of you? Right. So in Java, .NET, most OO languages, you can't do public component X, can you? It's public interface, public class, package namespace. Right, so our, our OO languages don't have these boxes as constructs. So we get this mismatch. Uh, George Fairbanks, the author of Just Enough Software Architecture, he calls this the model code gap. So my focus is, is therefore on the static structure. And the static structure is ultimately about code. So the reason my book is called Software Architecture for Developers is because I think the software architecture should be for developers. Uh, and essentially, we are the primary stakeholders. So therefore, let's create diagrams and models that make sense to us. So that's my, that's my pitch. Thanks, so here's mine. Which has got quite a lot of similarities, but definitely some, some different um, emphasis. So the key point for me is really about, are you going to create a model? Or are you going to draw a picture on a whiteboard? And both are valid things to do. Don't get me wrong, I do both a lot. But some models that are worth creating and putting a bit of work into are actually worth preserving. How do you preserve a model on a whiteboard? You take a digital photo, don't you? And if you want to manipulate that model in the future, what do you do? You <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Photoshop, or you draw it back and why might do it again. Um, so it's preserved, but in state you can change it, which is, of course, a limitation. The great thing about models, though, is that they capture stuff that Kobe can't. Kobe got lots of tools for, very valuable, we all understand that. But it, as Simon just said, you haven't got most of your architectural constructs in the code today. Ideally, at some point in the future, there will be programming languages with architectural constructs, but we haven't got those. So sketches are a good place to start up because you need to represent the stuff that's not in the code. Hopefully, no arguments there. The problem is you quickly run into a whole lot of limitations. You can't change them. You can't ask them questions. You can't manipulate them. You can produce two very similar ones without basically doing all the work again. So the models are about communication. And the set of ground rules, so that people understand what I'm looking at, and this is a bit where okay, I think we'll go back to common abstractions, is really useful. And UML is a good base to work from because it answers a number of these points. It allows you to capture things that code can handle. And it overcomes a number of limitations of sketches. You can keep stuff as the data and then manipulate it later. And you can have a number of very similar views where you've got one, one set of all the information. So what is a model? Well, my definition is it's any useful, simplified representation of reality. Spreadsheets are models, Java domain models are models, UML models are models, and indeed, if enough work is put into them, boxes and lines diagrams, they're done carefully in every models as well. Key thing is you're trying to represent a set of concepts to allow people to understand them. And that's the point. Because you want to communicate with people, you want to record things in the long term. How many of you have had to inherit a code base? I'm talking in the non-trivial code base. Yeah. 
And when you obviously you had the code, and uh, when you looked at the code, did you pretty well immediately understand the architectural system? Now, I didn't either. It's quite a painful process, isn't it? Because it's a, and even if forget the static stuff, that's what's important. But uh, people sort of structure 101 to some extent can help with. And when you start to think, here's a, here's a hierarchy of code, I wonder what it looks like in production. Unless you've got production to look at, and even if you have, it's really not clear what the relationship is. So um, a long-term record of something in systems, and I'm not talking hugely detailed stuff, just at the point where it's the map, if you like, it's very useful. And there's also the question about understanding. Can you, can you yourself understand all of your system? Can you ask yourself questions about it? Can you, can you investigate how things might change, how it might react in different circumstances? Can you do that for the code? I don't know, not. If you're asking those kind of questions, what you're doing is you're building, you're building a mental model on top of the code anyway. It might well be worth having put all that effort in, allowing someone else to share it. And that's a bit more than that. So is a model just a picture? No, I would argue. A diagram is a purely visual representation. A model is data that represents your system at a higher level of abstraction than the code. And you normally visualize that data through pictures, absolutely. But in fact, I've got some models of systems back at the office that I don't visualize through pictures. I've got spreadsheets that tell me how systems react to certain kinds of performance situations that actually I never visualize on a picture. Or very rarely, I mean, I'm not drawing a graph yet, but I'm not visualizing the system that way. So a model's got definitions, it's actually got data in it. And a picture helps you visualize the data. So that's the difference between the two. They're both important, and if you just had the data, that would be, be much easier. for human beings need, need the pictures. But the pictures are not pinned by the data. In UML, uh, just to get the technical specific for a minute, UML views the world as there's a database of data they will write, and you can have many views of that, different pictures, but they're all backed by one lot of data. Meaning, if you've got a whole lot of different component diagrams, You've got a thing called widget one on two of them. There's only one representation of widget one. Now, as software engineers, this is not very surprising, is it? If you have two, if you have the order for a customer on two different web pages, you're only going to have one of them in the database. But somehow, when we come to representing systems, we throw all that away and we go, I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to have the same thing in four different visits. And at no point do we stop and go, hang on, that's like a really bad idea. Because as soon as I need to change one of them, it will become inconsistent. That's the problem that UML style model systems are trying to help us with. However, the problem with UML, does this look good? If you can see it, UML diagram, it's looking to me as if it's really trying to pretend it's code. It's got almost as much detail, and more detail, ironically, than the code. Um, it's a high detail, high precision model. And if you ever go near academic software engineering, help you, then you'll find a lot of these. Academics are very, very keen on these. They feel there's a tremendous benefit of having everything about the system packed into one model. At the other end, you've got low detail, low precision models. This is when you strike to the whiteboard, being architect, and you've never, never had a with a whiteboard marker in your hands, and you make a point on someone, probably how good you are, um, about, by creating a quick sketch. Look, there's four things, chop them, here's how they relate to each other, do you get the point? Of course, they're all, they're all stunned by your genius knowledge and go back to the analysis and follow everything that we talked about. But, but th this can be low precision. You're just going to make a point where you invest in a particular, particular thing and you don't get the other detail into it. You're trying to communicate it quickly and you're then going to wipe it, wipe it. Probably because it wasn't quite as correct as you were trying to imply. You'd rather cover your tracks quickly. Um, white ones are great for that because they, they don't have the history. Um, you can also have people who try and create low precision, high detail models. Um, this is where someone's got something on the flip chart and someone says there's like a thousand classes and they're going to get as many of these as they can on there to help with it. I'm, I'm going to show you how this thing really works. Because you are the types, it's all about abstraction. This is what really matters. And so people put a huge amount of detail into something that actually is not going to live very long. And you probably find this is communicating much of and then, naturally, like uh, any of you at all, I've got the quad one I really want you to focus on. Low detail but high precision models is actually where I think the bad is. 
So you're being precise, as in you're not just making this stuff up. You're not dropping awkward details and going, there's a really nasty bit down here, but I'm not going to tell you about it. We're so happy not discussing that. No, no, if there's a nasty bit, I, I'm going to show you the fact that there's a circular set of pen or something. But I'm not trying to put all the detail on the detail. So I'm trying to show you an abstraction of the fairly precise one. And I think that's what models are using. Because they allow you to catch a lot of information that, um, frankly, this kind of model is not really getting across. But they're not trying to pretend in some way that they're a representation or a substitute for the code. So why do we use models? Um, and and why, why, why model the model and not just picture? And um, consistency. Uh, this whole thing about you only want the definition of something in one place. Don't repeat yourself. We do it in code all the time. Yeah, in most of our modeling activities, we don't have to help with it. We repeat ourselves as much as we like. And um, reporting, which sounds really, really boring until you try this for real. If you put a reasonable amount of effort, I'm talking probably a couple of man hands, I'm not trying to underplay this. If you put a, a bit of effort into a model and get a bit of data into it, that's accurate. You can ask all kinds of questions about a model. I did this in uh, a large bank where I was working on a big um, migration from one model environment to another. And we built a model in both environments. And people were quite amazed how quickly we could get enough data into the model and build useful reports on the model to answer a whole lot of questions like, if we shut this down, what's going to be affected? If we went, oh, that's really bad news. Here's all these things. I went, no, no, that's definitely not affected. We went, shall I just show you? It's going to get to this, it's going to this, and there's a temporary dependence into this. Oh, no way. Quite well, right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I forgot about that. We just shut this down, and then on Monday morning we found that it didn't work. So the, the model was a very useful place to keep a whole lot of information. Um, checking and validation. Um, I'm not actually um, suggesting that you, you do a tremendous amount, but actually, if you're trying to assert that it's complete, you can't assert that a whiteboard sketch is complete or not. Um, if you have a model, it's possible to interrogate a model it's a feel like specialised reporting. Have we, have we got anything that's marked as an external dependency linked to something external? Oh no, there's a few of them are actually. We've better go and finish that. We've obviously forgotten something before. And, and finally, sharing information. I don't know about you, but I have to generate very different representations of the same model. If I'm talking to a senior manager, those kind of blocks, the, the, the um, gradient um, stuff, I'm a big fan of those. They love them, because, and they're great for me because you can't, can't ask too many questions, can you? And if they do ask questions, you just go, ah, that, that detail's not showing this diagram, I'll, I'll come back to you. Whereas, if I'm talking to development teams, there's no point in trying to kind of flip flat through because that doesn't help anyone. You need quite a detailed representation. If you've got a model, you can create different representations quickly because they're all on top of you just drag stuff off a palette, change its colours. Remove the stuff that I want, export to that point, you're done, done. As opposed to sitting there thinking, thinking, right, how does this work? What's even more stuff up the last as you have copying it, taking stuff away and thinking, oh, I really have to remember to keep these two in sync, otherwise something will go wrong in the future. So you can generate many implementations. You can also generate stuff like Excel spreadsheets, which is really useful to check the details. So my analogy is, um, would you, if you were going shopping, write down your shopping list as Jason? Probably not. I'm sure there's someone here who's got that. Does exactly that. But I use Postman. If I do use Postman, Postman don't interrupt shopping lists. I'm not suggesting that Jason is a good representation for shopping lists. But if I've got system configuration data, I don't allow people to type it in in free text, because that's really hard to process, and I can't see it's going to make me correct on all those things. So it's a question of what you actually need from the model situation you're working in. If you've got a long lived model, you're going to put a bit of effort into it, and you actually may need to use it for a number of different things, you might want to look at data rather than a picture. If, on the other hand, you need to quickly get some points across, investigate something, or communicate quickly, and you don't need to do it, I'd put it on a whiteboard. Um, if you need to do machine readable models, UML, and I gave a talk last week, you can find it on the website. There's a core of your model, which is a good base to work on. The key thing you should not do is try to use UML out of the box without putting enough time into the edit. Because you wouldn't use C sharp without at least reading a thorough book on C sharp. So there's no point trying to use something like your UML if actually you're just going to sit there and talk and start going, how bad can this be? Well, you're not going to get what that. The key thing is you need to be steady in the model, which is relatively easy to do, but you do need to do that and get a bit back. 
So that's what Simon I think. So we've now got some questions and answers, which we can go through. Uh, we haven't got a question. I'm sure that might be able to answer at all. Um, but hopefully there will be questions. The question is, before we do that, have you got questions you'd rather ask rather than answer the ones that we're about to do? Yeah. yeah. Stuff that the picture's pointing at later. You, you don't start by capturing the 
That's too short. So there's a comment down front here. One of the questions we just answered, but the other one, um, you talked about the landlords into the engagement, then you've got this handover. It's a lot easier to hand over and talk through hand drawn diagrams or sketches that needs to talk through the page and through the hand drawn diagram. Well, so the comment is it's a lot easier to talk through a hand drawn diagram than a new and old Why? I, I believe on the field of the easier to consume. Why? Is it, 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 it gets it, in the size of what you're getting. Yeah, you need to walk through it. You can't just be a diagram. You do need to walk through it. So yeah. I'd argue that probably the problem is people haven't thought about just consuming the email. There's no point in me handing over pages and pages of kind of supposedly curriculum on diagrams and all picking them all the time. I mean, you need to walk through that as well. The other thing is you need to tailor the representation to people. Sorry, the other thing is talk about reading a book on C sharp, you know. You have no, not really. Uh, I was uh, afraid someone was going to ask mine. Mine, <laughs> mine would be UML distills 1.1 from like 10 years ago. Yeah. Because it's really thin and it's really simple. And my analysis don't use all of it. But what it doesn't, but what it doesn't explain is it's extremely normal, which is a real shame. Yeah. 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 Which is the whole paradigm. My talk from this conference last year was with UML. So, this is an interesting format. Um, I, th I think I, if I understand the two sides, I can boil it down to three differences. One of which is tooling, okay, the ability to ask questions and move up and down and stuff, and I find that a red hair, and I don't yep. really care that much about it, right? Um, the second difference that I see is the difference in, I'll call, uh, coupling or duality, okay? Should there be a model in code, or should there be one, or which one matters? I'd like you two to discuss that exactly, okay? Um, and what is the third one? Uh, the third one has to do with question. If I have a tool that I can ask a question to, is that preferable to having a person that I can ask a question to? In other words, an architect. Okay. I think that's also an interesting domain for me. You managed to get three questions in there in one conversation. That's right, three questions. Yeah. So three questions are, um, two in one bother. Um, Question on the duality of models and code? Yeah, couple. Yeah, I think we agree on that question. Um, and then, if you're going to ask questions, why not just ask a person rather than two? Well, I, I, I don't think that you two are in agreement on the, on the idea of, you know, is, is there one or there's two? I mean, okay. if, there, if, it, if it's either one thing or it's the other, maybe a model is executable, maybe. The code is all that really matters. I, I, I really like you to get to the bottom of that one. You're kind of tacitly saying, oh, yeah, 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 we agree on that. You don't. I don't think. Okay. I, I'm not going to ask that question because I will spoil something I'm going to say later. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll be on the slide up here. Yeah, I'll be on the slide To pick up your points about you have to walk through a diagram, you're right. And actually, if you look at most UML diagrams, I don't think they contain enough information because they're just boxes with a name in. I have no idea what that thing is. Yep. So, so therefore, maybe UML is not a good way to describe things. Maybe if we had a rich notation, then we don't have to do so much. You know, it's coming to understand the work where we can walk through this diagram and explain it to you. Who's inherited a system with existing documentation and you've been asked to look at the pictures and they make no sense? That's like all of us, right? So maybe it's the notation. Yeah. Point. No documentation. Can I just follow up that point by you? Looking to see more information on the diagram to get that rich of the sort of thing to be able to find that information as well. So, I'm, I, I, both those, so I'm looking for more information elsewhere. I was going to say in a model, but I'm going to say elsewhere for a second. <laughs> and, more definite, and definitely more information visually on the pictures. Which I agree with, actually. I mean, um, if you Flip to the kind of more academic community. This is quite funny. It, in this forum, I'm seen as a sort of apologist for UML. In the academic community, I'm seen as this far green dragon who is trying to destroy UML. <laughs> I'm sort of, sort of sitting between the two worlds. And, uh, I completely agree. Your base UML is nearly useless. And I've said, certainly said that at uh, more academic conferences and in the industry. Um, it's nearly useless because it's just grey boxes with unadorned lines. And, well, and? I mean, you might as well draw boxes and lines diagram. The only point of UML is it gives you the chance to create a much more specialist notation, 
which is reasonably well defined annual children in sales. Unless you're going to do that, UML is probably not very useful to you. That would be my position. I'll write that down. The UML is basically UML is nearly pointless. Quote it. I've written that. I'll put that on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so, um, coming to code. So, uh, okay, so my view on that is um, the code is all that matters at the end of the day. Everything is, uh, everything we do, in fact, good principles somebody gave me the other day, um, anything an architect does should have an impact on a piece of code. There may be a couple of links in the chain, but it should have an impact on a piece of code. Why? Because the only thing that runs in production and generates value is the code. That said, the code is, uh, we actually deal in abstractions because we, we, we can't understand the amount of code once. So code has only got abstractions up to a certain level. So therefore, if we want to record the abstractions beyond what code today can give us, we need to use some other kind of representation. I think we agree on that. So no. 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 <laughs> no. I think we should get better at providing modular systems. So although Java.net whatever doesn't have a component keyword, we can still create components and modules. So if you look at Java, there's there are two ways to create you know, hot swappable modules. You've got things like OSGI. And we can just stop writing public classes, right? If we stopped using the public keyword a little bit and maybe put package protected stuff in packages and, and wrap that up as a thing, right? We've got a bigger thing to work with. We've got modularity. And then we can start to say, look, modularity in code, modularity in picture. So it's, it's not it's not about just inventing some new stuff on top of the code. We can we can modularize our code. Only a very limited way. But even, as George Fair, I have to say, this architecture of encoding, which um, Simon and I both quite admire, um, it's very hard to represent connect as well. So architecture, architecture fundamentally is about stuff, components, stuff that makes stuff together, connectors. It's very hard in most languages today to create something that is unambiguously, obviously, a connector, because the languages just don't support that. Because the connector is often something like an MQ, which the representation of that in the code is rather transitory at best. It's often configuration, right? That you're injecting with. In fact, we abstract ourselves from what the connector is and how it works. So you've got to put that in a model, or you've just got to remember it. Or in some idealized view of the world, you interrogate the running system, which is what I really like to do. But again, I'm not aware of technology that lets me do that. Okay, follow up. Yep. What's the most important view? I think you both kind of agree it's not a static view. I, I think you do think it's a static view. I think it's a static view. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I know you well. I know. Uh, Static view is what you say is the most important, the most connected to the code. I think the most important view is the runtime function view. Ah. So, so the, that's the thing you can't see from the code. I, I was, so that's, that's what I was going. That's my question at the start was, <coughs> if I give you the code base, can you discern the architecture of the system? What you is all the went, not really. Well, that suggests that there's some information. So for me, it's the runtime function view. Okay, well, by runtime functionality, what's the hardest thing in UML to try to relate? Okay, uh, things like asynchronous um, operations, you know, what relates to what in real time? It's the hardest thing to represent. Uh, there's lots of things. <laughs> um, the hardest thing to represent is, I don't have a really good answer off the top of my head. I'd say probably, probably complicated connectors. Publish, subscribe. Type connectors are reasonable. It, it is quite possible to do them. In fact, I might look okay. There's stuff in about that. But actually, it's a bit of a jump. So, uh, basically, real time interactions. Yeah. With, okay. That's the more difficult end of it. Yeah. And how, do, and how do each of you represent those? So, sorry, second? Yeah, how do, you, how do you represent real time interaction? I don't. Sections? Is it important? No. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It is important, but I don't normally represent it. But you have to code for it. Yes. Okay. So, right. so how, does that, how does that um, percolate up and out? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question either. Okay. I'll answer later. There's a nice bit. Surely the most important view depends on the user And yeah, if you go back to the one or seven one definition of views, it talks about stakeholders and subgroups. So if I need to view them, I'm going to take the CIO to explain why the system is a piece of crap. That's going to be very different to the view of the same system of takes and developers to explain the difference of this. So I don't think you can answer what's the most important view. I think it depends. It's the key. And it's 
you move to this language, I don't care about making sure that all software developers speak the same language yet. But as a team, whether that's three or four of us, up to 20, 30, 40, 50, as a team, we need to be able to talk the same thing. And for me, that's the real, the real benefit of doing what we do. Yeah, um, my view is um, the purpose of modeling helps you understand both what you've got and what you need, which is a hint there about the current state, future state. I mean, that, that's, I keep coming across situations where people don't quite understand what they've got. That's kind of what Simon's talking about. If you've got one map or two, or more abstractly, I've got two attempted systems or 16. No one's quite sure. I've sort of been some catalog, but no one's quite sure what they're connected to. Um, then um, this question of if this isn't perfect, and to be honest, a little variety of environments are perfect, what would perfect or good enough look like? And there's a lot of people care about the answer to that question. And you need to communicate that somehow too. So that's, that's a definite use I have a model. It's also in systems though. And the actual software structure, we all agree this isn't very good, we think it's a bit shabby, we all miss stuff from here. But we may not all agree on what good looks like. So having some instructions to what good looks like before we start on the road will avoid lots of disappointment and disagreements from the end of the so we there's that mother of all pull requests for 120 files and everything goes, what on earth has happened here? It, it's good to have that discussion before. Um, you can't understand the detail anyway. Um, the, the, there is sometimes an argument, I don't use models, I just look at the code. Well, I would argue you probably don't look at all the code all the time. And you can't hold it on your head. Uh, if you are doing that, with all due respect, you're working on a fairly small system. Not the scale system that most of us work on today, most of the time. And the thing is, we're all modeling all the time anyway. The code we're writing is a model. I mean, who thinks code is real? I mean, that's clearly nonsense. The code is an abstraction of something that goes into a compiler. The compiler produces something that is optimized. The optimized stuff then goes into some kind of deployment environment. That then goes onto a CPU. The CPU is completely virtual as well. That's not real. The CPU is taking what we think is as the lowest level binary code, and it's going, man, what do you say, branch, what do you mean is, and it's converting to something completely else while the memory code. So it's all models. I mean, if you talk to chip designers, they talk a lot about models. They, they think of the stuff they're doing inside chips as basically a model, because they can't deal with the complexity they're working with. So we're getting the models anyway. It's a question of why would you stop with a modeling language and a modeling approach that can represent the concept you're trying to talk about? You need to continue to the next level. So basically, we agree. And, and, the code is, and, and the code can't tell you everything. Think that's more reasonable. In a few slides, I'm sure we'll find something to disagree with. <laughs> so, modeling and agility. Right. Not, so, uh, we could be on the but What we're really saying is does modeling help or hinder agility? Is it compatible or incompatible with agility? Um, the whole agile thing is fantastic, but when it came along, people threw away, threw away modeling. A lot. Because they attached modeling to the big heavyweight processes that we used to do, you know, big side up front. Uh, and they're two separate things. My thing about modeling, uh, and particularly, you know, sketches, is to just communicate quickly and effectively. Why? Because if you're trying to move fast, you need good communication. You need that ubiquitous language, and you need to make sure that everybody is heading the same direction. And it's as simple as that, really. Um, a model, as Owen has already said, provides long-lived documentation. Right, so people are going to join, leave, move teams, have babies, whatever. So we do need some you know, consistent, continual documentation there. And in terms of agility, so in terms of doing you know, just enough upfront design, I still think modeling is a part of that. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of doing a kind of lightweight, pragmatic, upfront design phase, if you want to call it that, where we do some quick lightweight modeling. And the purpose of that lightweight modeling is to basically understand the structure of what we're building to a degree, so we can all head in the same direction. It's about creating that vision. And it's about giving us a starting point for analyzing and, and identifying the key risks that we might run into. So it really is about setting the scene for you know, running an agile approach. So, modeling and efficiency, yes. Yeah, this one again, we don't disagree too much about it, but it's just probably the same thing said differently. Um, there is no fundamental conflict providing a modeling on purpose. The thing that agile teams very reasonably rebel against is uh, waste, and I rebel against waste too. 
frankly, I'm far too busy to start creating models that nobody cares about. Um, if nobody cares about the model, and clearly you don't create like any other deliverable in an uh, agile life cycle. Uh, John Daniels, who um, I suspect none of you have heard of, but he's very influential and has been very influential in the UK software community in general, um, wrote one of the classic books on sort of developing model systems. Um, he's got this great phrase, which is model with purpose, um, and that's sort of catchphrase for it. And that sums up that for me, if you haven't got a purpose, an audience for a model, don't create one. After all, the manifesto, as I'm holding the point to note, values working software over comprehensive documentation. Doesn't say that documentation is worthless. Um, the thing is, agility needs to be for the long haul. It's quite easy, I would argue, to be agile for a year or so on a mid sized system. But you need to be agile for five years on many amount of code systems. That's the size of the problem that we're actually asking agile development to address. And as we all know, if you have a million lines of code, and you've turned up your development teams twice, you've now got big problems communication, comprehension, and understanding. And that's, I think, the whole level model is coming. <coughs> for example, for your system, do you know what all the feed dependencies are? I'm sure you will do, because you want them to software architect. But it's easy to find teams who actually aren't quite sure. And it's quite hard for them to mine that out of their source spaces. And they have a model for the context of their system, therefore they're not too sure what all the feed dependencies are. They can probably make the top 10. So I'm nervous about your second bullet here, about long documentation. So typical experiences you do in architecture. Build the system, then you go on and make developers build something that's a bit different. Maybe because the architecture model is a bit wrong. Um, over time, they change it, and the real thing that people diverge is more and more from the model, the point at which the model becomes useless. The way to fix that, I guess, is to keep the model up to date with what you actually build. It's quite hard to do that between people who are either people who have your thoughts on that and the issues of people are doing. If you model it, then it will still be the to just throw away the original. So, uh, just to repeat the question, my question is, if you do some modeling up front, and then you start building the system, the model is ultimately going to become outdated. So, you know, should we keep it up to date, or should we just bin it and throw it away and replace it? Um, I do have some thoughts, but I'm going to save them for later. I'll go to Yeah, please do. Uh, my thoughts briefly would be, if you're still getting value from the model, it's worth putting effort in to keep it up to date. Second thing is, in the model, you should have the long lived stable instructions, not all these are. If you said we're going to have a calculation server, an analytic server, and a user interface server, and you end up with a single monolithic server doing all three, that's not so much a diversion from the model, that's a completely new architectural design. And you can decide whether that's a good or a bad thing, but um, uh, you know, if the architectural model needs an update for three weeks, Either the project's going quite badly wrong, it's having to backtrack disastrously, or the model's starting to do it. Um, I would say, um, what was my phone for? Oh, and don't be afraid to delete them. If, if, if you get the value from them, then move them back to being useful. Maybe not delete them, we just mark them very clearly in a dead model area. Uh, you know, your tool just moves them into an area that says, by all means, look at this by historical context, clearly mark the model. This doesn't affect. So, so just to throw in another point and to pick up on how it's points about coupling the models to code, the alternative thing is to generate models auto-magically from code. Right? And there are lots and lots of tools out there which, which use diagrams. So uh, Structure 101, Endepend, Lattix, Soma, Java Architects, there's a whole list of them. Has anybody tried them? Do you like them? Everyone's shaking their heads. Why, why not? And what's wrong with these tools? Too many details. You know. It doesn't know what's important. There are too many details. Too yes. many details, right? There's another big point, okay? And this is the central point of why so that it, tooling is a red herring. When we talk about electrical engineering and why we can build these terribly complex systems reliably and fault free and all that, it's because the modeling that they do can be executed. We don't have any modeling tools that allow us to execute our code before we start to build it. And that's why I am in the camp of saying, yeah, I need to understand it, I need to draw some diagrams. The modeling doesn't help because we don't have the right to build it. Right. I think another thing about this, I'm not used to those tools, but I imagine you're doing it something that's far too detailed for what you want to use for architecture. Yeah. So abstraction is about taking away, but it's, it's 
the experience of the architect, I think, that guides you towards what you do take away from a model. And you can look at something, and in one system, transactionality might be really important, so you want to focus on that. In another, it's irrelevant, so you wouldn't show it. There's no way that a tool can know that until it becomes as intelligent as architects. And then the person will pick up. So you need a person who can look at something that like recognizes what's Right, so, so, so basically tools tools show you too much detail and they don't know what to take away to make the simplified things well. We, we were talking about this on, on the Skype point in the evening. Those tools, although they call themselves architecture tools, they're not. They're basically diagram tools that show you package and class dependencies. Yeah, but they're, they're very narrow special. If the information you want isn't in the code, just accessible. There aren't any architectural concepts in the code. Why do the tools think they can extract them? And this incidentally is not just commercial tool for this. There's an entire cottage industry, or maybe big in the cottage industry, of academic researchers desperately trying to build a present which I keep having this conversation with, saying this isn't a useful thing to be doing. The information you're looking for is not here. It's somewhere else. But it could be. Maybe. Thank It sounds like good. In general, the agile um, methods, it sounds like there seems to be the need for a ramp up in it of aligning the two the code models. And then to the point of execution, execute the model. That's where I started my career and by the end of the project we were in we were because because there was so much change in all that stuff. We need to get to yes it has an executable state but not building its models. Right, right. there was this whole thing about ten or twelve years ago model driven architecture. Create a big model of the world, put some executable UML or Java code or script in, press the magic, build my system button. Wow, system. If you want to modify your system, you change the model, press the button, I'll get a new system. What a horrendous idea. That takes away all of the experience and learnings over the past 40 years of building software from scratch and throws it all in the bin. I'm sure those systems are beautifully well designed and scalable. <laughs> anyway. Yep, continue. Yep, I was start ranting around here. <laughs> How do we actually do it? How do we do it? So, uh, so top down decomposition has gone out of fashion, but I like it. Right, so I start with the big picture and I work down into the detail. It's as simple as that. Doesn't mean it's, it's one way, we can revisit you know, upper layers when if we uncover new things, but that's my, that's my kind of route through to you know, designing and modeling. You need to stop when you get to a sufficient, you notice I use quotes here, sufficient level of detail. And this is the whole question of well, how much upfront design should we do? Um, for me, it's about going to the level of components, right? It's about going to core screen abstractions. And, and I'm not going to say too much more about that because we'll, we'll touch on it later. And when we're, clear, when, we're, when we're doing modeling and drawing pictures, technology choices must be included, right? None of this technology agnostic stuff. When you're designing software, you have stuff in your head, preferences, experiences, technologies you think you might want to use, and those technologies are going to influence the model. Put the tech choices into the model, because then it makes those choices much more clearer. And it also brings the model back down to earth, and stops it being all fluffy and conceptual. My approach is probably not that dissimilar, but the key piece of advice I have is start small and start with purpose. And start modeling from the front of it. You also don't try to model everything at once. <coughs> Spending more than an hour or two creating models initially, stop. Focus on the importance of figure out who's actually going to get value from this. It's very likely you need to do a week of modeling before <coughs> someone gets value. If you do, you need to think about whether there are a much more incremental approach you can take. Obviously, incremental model, incremental model. Start with a whiteboard or an app or an A4 or an A3 sheet of paper. Just start with something really simple. I nearly always start with sheet of paper, actually, because I'm old and all that pencils. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people like whiteboards and digital cameras, and that's fine too. Um, I suggest that skipping the visio and only graphic stage, if you need to do something more than whiteboards and taking photos, I think at that point it's worth using some kind of tool, because as I've said, <coughs> I think you get a much better return on your investment when you start to gather a lot of detail. The problem with tools is you spend a lot of time lining boxes up. Choosing gradient shadings. It's the speed that's I like pretty diagrams. <laughs> yeah, some of my diagrams are a bit messy, but I don't think it's all. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. It's not just the diagrams being pretty, it's important. There's a lot of implied meaning in some diagrams in order to let things up. Um, and you know, going back to your proof of layers, picture that you showed at the beginning. 
those things really annoyed me because there's, there's line, there's an indication of having a box higher up on that than the one that's lower down. I mean, one on top of the other implies that they interact in some way. And often they don't. It's just the way that they're drawn. In. So um, I think the, there is a really important aspect of architectural diagrams that you need to think about where you put things because by putting something in the bottom makes it look more fundamental or less important. Right, it's like the foundation. Yeah, yeah, because being in the middle, you know, it's some sort of garden at the top, but I think you're, you're implicitly conveying that information. Yeah, you've got, I completely agree. You've got to be very careful about what the diagram is implying through color, shape, positioning, relative size, and so on. There's a nice, like, it's, a, it's an academic paper, uh, which you can probably find a link to on the website, I think, otherwise ping me about it using graphical notation or how graphical notation affects communication. And I found it tremendously useful when designing graphical notations to bear on this in mind that when people look at your map, it's a, it, it's a visual framework. It, there are all kinds of opportunities there to actually communicate to all of which we've taken. It's not the thought about it. And that's, it, it, it can really make a difference to it. I wonder what the, uh, how do you remember from the university? Uh, <coughs> the uh, amusing things happened was we were being taught modeling by lecture, who to be fair, has spent 20 years in the industry, knew a lot about it. And I was doing some, I think it was DFD, on that one. He was doing data for the diagram. And then somebody said, I think you missed this piece. And he said, yeah, yeah, quite right. Yeah, yeah, we, we need to integrate data from all um, the data from the picture, whatever. And uh, the student earnestly said, so where would you put that? Why would you make that decision? The pro professor John Ray spoke to him for a moment and said, I'd put them right over here in the bottom right hand corner. And the students all went, really? Why would that be? He said, plenty of space for it. Not the way to put something. So it's two possibilities. The one, have a look at the whole thing, but you're going to have to be very abstract. Or focus in on the bit that everyone cares about. And I'd probably do that because they can get more value out of that. So you're not talking about paper size. Because when I run my training course, people can start an A4 paper and then migrate to big paper. <laughs> That's how we think. Scale of is just on that point. You start a camera for free, you start where it's important. But I think that. You could then divide inside a single scale. You could. I rely on your skills and judgment as a professional architect to understand the rest of it. So you've already, you've already got a good understanding of where you go again. Or you start investigating before you start modeling. I mean, that's really the point. Is don't start modeling this corner if you actually don't understand what's in all the other corners. Because you might be looking at the wrong corner. But again, again, when you inherit something, yep. you still the same thing. You do. Yeah, which is perhaps the first thing you do is not build a model. First thing to do is understand, investigate, you know, kind of get to understand the conceptual plane, and then you can figure out where the value of the model is coming from. Question four, you have a little bit of that. Simon thought about this for a long time, and he really <laughs> analyzed the possible answers he could give you. So there's, there's all that nuance in that one. Right, right. So, so, so my full answer to this is no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my slightly longer answer, we can't have a really um, is uh, yes, maybe. Um, if you need to hold stuff in the in data and you're going to want to manipulate it and ask questions, then I, as I say, I don't know a better base on which to build a decent modern language than then you're So, can I ask a follow up question? I mean, Owen, oh, that the modeling stuff that you talked about generating views from data is brilliant. I, I kind of really think that that's very important. That is there something better? Um, I'm going to use it instead. If not, should something be designed and built with that? There should, uh, so the question is, is this going to be better? The answer through my fairly recent and very, very thorough, painfully thorough um, safari through the research literature is no. There's a whole, um, anyone ever heard of the architectural description languages? Yeah, not a single person. Oh, one or two. Okay. So, architectural description languages are a favourite topic of academics. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Roughly in the last 10 years, how many published architectural description languages have been highly properly published? 20 page paper, probably research tool, three or four people working on it. Yes, how many? Throughout the number. About 100. About 100, yeah. yeah. Probably somewhere north of 100, actually. Can you imagine all the intellectual efforts that went into that? And how many of them are used in industry? I have to know this because it's from the literature center. It's not zero. How many have been used in the industry? About four. Four or five hundred, which is pretty poor hit rate. 
Um, so uh, the answer is there's not a practical thing to dig up because you need a tremendous, the thing that always stymies academics, even if they've got the right thing, is you need blogs, you need books, you need tutorials, you need people like Simon Brown and Ben to go fly around Europe and talk people about it. You need good, really robust, powerful tooling, all stuff that academics go, no, that was very interesting. I don't think we're going to get a research grant to go ten years for doing that. So they move on and leave potentially very good ideas on the shelf. So that's the way it works, and that's the reason the academic research stuff is all going to work. No, there's nothing better about it right now, which is why I found back to you. I'm actually on record as saying somewhere in some article, your is a really, really poor architectural description language, but it's the best one we've got by quite a long way. You're also, you're also now on record for saying basically. <laughs> 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 Uh, so, this is small models. models. Big models and small models. So, uh, this picks up on your point about sketches. So, sketches it will become out of date. Um, even on the smallest team, even if it's just you and you have a whiteboard picture and you start coding, it will become out of date very, very quickly. Um, the reverse engineering tools tend to lead to cluster diagrams, and that's the other approach, particularly if you have large systems to auto generate pictures, but that doesn't work. Um, so my, I guess my advice here, my simple advice, is to have lots of simpler diagrams rather than one Uber diagram that tries to conquer the world. That's how you deal with, you know, models of scale. That doesn't give you a sufficient answer, but I'll talk more about some aspects of it. So the challenge you can is keeping them all alive. In yeah. Especially if they're separate pictures yes. and they're not a model. Uh, so my view is um, it's large models are kind of difficult and small models are not really terribly difficult. Um, if you've got a large system that probably implies a large model, um, you would try and manage this kind of volume of data. It, if an end user was managing this volume of data in Excel or um, not, you know, using bits of paper, you'd immediately come up to the desk and go, you know, we need a computer to help with that, and you run the system, even if it was only an answer. Um, same thing actually in, with large amounts of information about your system, you need some help from the computer. And uh, incidentally, uh, I've also seen people do really good work uh, in industry, completely off their own back, sort of in their lunch times, building sort of relational databases to hold the holders. And then they figure out using graph or something how to do a good enough visualization of it. And that is another way of doing scale of this model. Uh, the key thing is you need help from the computer. Um, remember, though, the problem is these models take on life of their own. You spend enough time using a model, this is possibly a reason to kill models regularly right <coughs> and start the game. If you put enough effort into a big model, as soon as the guys have got their own relational databases, uh, it becomes the point. And then, oh, there is some production code as well, but actually, have you seen the model? It's just so cool. Look at the questions I can answer. Yes, but how does it relate to the code? Yeah, 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 there is code. But anyway, about my model again. Um, so it's not the point, the code is the truth. Um, however, it's worth saying this is another benefit of picking a model language that's actually been beaten around the for 20 years. They scale quite up well. You can scale them out to very good models and they can help you keep up the control. Using techniques inherent in large different programming languages, but we've got very big code bases. <coughs> the same lessons that we learned and can be applied to very big models. So I think that's the end of our questions and answers. There's now a slightly expanded, well, quite, quite significantly expanded question of how we might go about to give you a little bit more detail. I'm conscious we've got 15 minutes. So we're actually going to ask a question. Yeah, so I've been uh, deferring answers until later. Now is later. <laughs> so, so how do I do this? I'm a big fan of pictures, and sketches, and whiteboards. But I'm right, right? These pictures, they're not models, uh, and there's a number of downsides in that. So coming back to the abstractions, I, I like to create a set of abstractions with the teams I'm working with. And basically, I think about the software system as being made up of a number of containers. So a container is something like a web application, a standalone application, a mobile app, a browser app, a database file system is somewhere that you can put code data, right? Something that needs to be running in the environment for your system to work end to end. My container is made up of components. This is a hugely overloaded word, but I'm trying to create some chunks of stuff, that are highly related, cohesive stuff with a nice clean interface, like modularity. You can call these modules or services if you want to. And because I mostly build systems in Java.net, my components are made up of classes. Right, so this is what I was talking about. This is the static model. And it's a really simple tree structure. The system made up of containers, they can take components which are made up of classes. And from this, and you, and you like the title of the side of the model. So this is my C4 model. And it's a way 
It's a math model. Probably. Can I do it here? So, so with that series of abstractions in, in mind, and, and you know, thinking about systems being decomposed in that way, we can then draw a bunch of pictures. So we can start with a system context diagram, and I'll show you some quick examples in a second. I'll then draw a containers picture to show the overall shape of the solution. I'll then dive into each of the interesting containers and show the components inside it. This, this is four, right? There are three. The fourth one's optional, right? Please do not misquote me. This fourth one's optional. If you want to go down to really low levels of detail, you can do class level modeling if you want to. Right, so I built a, a really basic content aggregator for the local tech world in Jersey. It's called techtribes.j. The icon's a monkey. And basically, this is my system content diagram of my tech tribe site. So you guys can go log on now, and you'll be an anonymous user, and you can do these things. My content is aggregated onto the site, so I can log in with my Twitter ID and want to do more stuff, and there's also an admin user. So the content diagram basically shows my key types of users. You can call them roles, personas, whatever you want to. Stuff at the bottom are my key system dependencies, so this is how tech clubs fits into the rest of the world. Uh, you call data for Twitter, blogs, and GitHub. So it's a nice high level picture. Great for non technical people, business people, but it still shows the static structure. For us as techies, we want to open up a monkey set to look at one. This line here is my system boundary. I still have people at the top and systems at the bottom. And basically, this diagram says my tech drive system is made up of an Apache Tomcat web application that does this stuff. Remember, I said that boxes and names are ambiguous, so you'll see my diagrams have boxes, names, tech choices, and brief statement responsibilities. So I'm trying to create a slightly richer notation here. Where does the data come from? There's a content updated down the bottom, and it's the that connects out to Twitter, GitHub, blogs, pulls the data back. Where's the data being stored? Well, there's a MySQL database in the middle, a MongoDB store for tweets and blog posts, and a file system in the middle for search indexes. So it's a, it's a kind of logical view of the technology, the overall structure. This doesn't talk about deployment or clustering or availability, that kind of thing. It's just the static structure again. We zoom into the content updated thing at the bottom, and this is an example of the components picture. So this box here is my content updater container. It's my standalone application. I've got my external systems down there because they talk to the outside world, and the containers that I integrate with at the top. And basically, this just shows how I've modularized my standalone content data into a bunch of components. Cohesive things, names, responsibilities, and also tech choices. So you'll see some lower level technology choices in there. You now, Twitter for J, Eclipse Mining, Spring, that's sort of These are pictures, right? These pictures specifically are done in the Omnigraph for the Mac. Which is basically just Visio. And you know, all the stuff we talk, talk about this morning, this doesn't scale and this stuff does become out of date. So, what I'm playing with at the moment, and this is very much an experiment of work in progress, is I'm creating a bunch of tooling to extract these elements from a code base. In order to do this, you need to adopt George Fairbanks' architecturally evident coding style stuff. So, in other words, you need to write modular systems, you need to have clean modules with clean interfaces. And then you can write some code that extracts those concepts and creates a model of them in code. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create an architecture model as a code. Right, so this is something we can do as well. So you can see that create a software system, create a person, wire them together, create some containers, and then there's some magic here we can use to go and kind of scrape the code base. So this is all very much a work in progress. You can go to structurewise.com and there's a GitHub library where you can run this over Java code bases. So I'm trying to keep that C4 model, but turn it into an actual modeling environment. So that's how I do it. When I get some time to do it. So some kinds of models that I want to be able to produce, these are ones that I actually need in my day-to-day -day work. I need to describe the system environment. So that's the kind of context model, which looks a bit familiar a moment ago. And I want to know what the runtime structure of my system is. So what things run, what services do I have, um, 
do I have, uh, you know, the same reason I don't have an analysis service running which is separate, which is a different thing from some kind of user interface services um, element. So that, I call that functional. Um, it's a functional pieces. And I do need to, I do want to understand what my software meets the infrastructure. I want to be quite clear, even if it's all virtual, I just, I'd actually like to state that thing, that I'm going to do all this on virtual hosts, or I'm going to put it on IIS, or I'm just using a traditional old physical host or database server, or whatever. I want to show the mapping between running things and stuff that they run on top of it. And possibly shared services and use them. And there's also stored and in-transit data. Um, I'd say strangely for information systems, I probably did less of this than I, I sort of expected to some years ago, or maybe less than I should, but I definitely still have some cases where I need to show fundamental information structures, particularly when it comes to information that's moving around, so messaging versus the data. I'd like to show that relationship in some kind of data. Nick Rosansky and I came up with um, another model for how you, how you model a, a software systems architecture. We've got a few more bits, but actually most of them that's very, very neatly to see form. Um, we also have a context view, which defines where the system moves. And then we have three views that define the structure of the fundamental structure of the system itself. The functional view, what is there at runtime and how is it connected together? The information view, what data moves around and what data is at rest, where does it live? And the concurrency view, which most of you in Java.net will not create. If, however, you're, doing, you're building feed infrastructure going into a financial exchange, your threading model is of a lot of interest to everyone. Are you going to go reactor? Are you going to go thread per request? Are you going to go pull the thread? That kind of thing is really important um, to get there. I've actually not created one of these for years because I've not worked on those kind of systems. If you're mainly using standard industry containers, you don't need one of these. If you're doing something with a lot of custom concurrency, you would. And that defines fundamentally the, the software, if you like. And then, um, well, the runtime is not really. Then the remaining three views are the development view. That's all the code structure stuff. You want to, it's a common ground between architecture and design. When I say I want you to create these runtime elements, I also want you to use the following pattern when you implement all of the network lessons. So that's the stuff in the development view. Also, if you have strong views on module structure or particular tooling and stuff, there's the development view. And the deployment view is the bit, is where the system meets the infrastructure. And the operational view is how you talk to your production services people. How are you going to get into production, keep it there, remove it if it goes wrong, monitor it, find out, find out if bad things happen, all that stuff. The reason we have these particular views is for two reasons. One, we don't repeat information very much between them. We minimize repetition. The second thing is they are focused on particular groups of people. Most people want to understand the <coughs> Quite a lot of people want to understand the function. A fair number less want to understand the information, and relatively few want to understand the concurrency. The de only the development team want to understand the development view, but they really need to understand it. The infrastructure people and operations probably want to understand deployment. No one else is that interested. When it comes to the operational view, you're probably just talking to production services. So they're focused on the needs of the people who actually care. So to give you an example, it looks rather familiar, it's a context I've barely been explained. It's a system in the middle, stuff around it, there's connections between them. I use UML stereotyping in various places, which is not very much of this one, um, to make it clear what kind of link I've got. My functional view is a bit, is very similar, in fact, to Simon's um, container scheme. I've got a Tomcat container, it's got a number of things inside it that communicate between them, um, and there's another container, which is an oracle database, which is something inside a forest. The thing you probably can't see is that this isn't base UML. I haven't bothered changing the pictures of this one, I probably should have to make the point, but all of these icons can be changed. And these are these are specialized, these are subtypes. This isn't just a component, this is a Pojo service. This isn't any other component. This is a service. This is an EMS probably subscribed topic. So they're quite specific in terms of the technical type of thing. Um, and I, I, when I've defined a new type, I can define a new picture. And that's what suddenly you, you're building your own much richer language on top of base URL, which I still say is the instance. The deployment view um, defines the, the things and the software services on which you're going to be deploying stuff. And it's not more complicated than that. Uh, 
just as a tip, um, you nearly always find patterns of this in UML. Notice it's compute server, not host one, host two, and host three. You don't actually get into the mapping to the physical stuff. It's just a point. What you want to explain to people is really the shape of the deployment environment or system feeds. So that's how I do it. What on earth have we talked about for the last 90 minutes? It's just a problem. I'm sure you've enjoyed it. We started off by saying modeling is useful, and we both had different perspectives on that. But fundamentally, we think it's terrifically useful, used the right way. Because it helps people communicate, helps make things clear, and allows you to perform analysis of various sorts, informal, formal, something in between, on the models that you create. We've got many ways of doing it, from napkins in restaurants to full blown UML tooling with, with lots of competition. Um, the important thing is there's a spectrum there, and it's trade off it every step of the way. So, being intelligent people, you've got to find the right point on that spectrum for your environment and the people you work with, including you. The key point is not believing in the models at the end point and getting value from all the kind of, kind of different modeling activities that you do. So, I, I, I guess the summary is modeling, yes, yes. UML, no. Uh, is that, is that <laughs> uncompromised there? <laughs> Only yes. You are Melfrey. <laughs> so that's us. Um, we've got three minutes. So we're not allowed to hold up for the coffee break. So we've got three minutes of questions. I'd like to thank you. So there's people in the room who are kind of convinced the ones that are going to be in the room. Um, the over confidence and documentation team um, manifesto. How do you get that across? Because, yes, it have gone from documentation to nothing. Have we really back to some level of balance? You saw, I believe, sort of people group with not the room. Yeah, this was the self selected group that went modern. That might be interesting. Because the, the rest of the conference went modern. Like, really? <laughs> can't wait to come and say that. was a really good question. But the science of much more strength to be, in my limited domains, uh, the way I do it is by showing people the knowledge gaps they've got. And actually, I found that people to be reasonably receptive to it. The other thing is, examples that I'm going to leave by doing it. For any modern show they've got value, people can then. But I find every team actually there's a there's a link more to their head in it who just doesn't want to put their hand up. Once they've seen some value, there's a bit of back in their head actually. Because remember that's the other thing, uh, just published academic research with this, not everyone can model. Don't kill yourselves that everyone can generate a good model. I we we found in a very large scale exercise in previous employment of mine. We found something like 20% of the development community could generate models, even with coaching. That's something to bear in mind. Is there'll be a latent model in every team. You don't expect every team to be full of latent models. And a, a micro device is to show you the benefits. So I often work with agile teams who don't want to do any drawing pictures at all. And, and, and their example of a model is one box that says system. And that's it. <laughs> and then when you, when you walk through this exercise and you show them the value of, say, going down to components, they go, oh, yeah, that's actually pretty really useful. So just demonstrate is it's a key part of things. And the wider community just that. The wider community, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. Same thing, exactly the same approach. Again, it comes down to target audience.